I suppose in one way, this subject could be referring to us knowing either his purpose or his name, and whether we know it. Although, as we shall see, the two are so closely connected in the Bible. Of course, when we talk of names, we, we all have a name, whether that's all kinds of names there could be. It might be Lydia, or Matthew, or Simeon, or any kind of names that we have. And when we come to the Bible, we find that Bible names have meaning. And in fact, every time, I think I can say, every time a name is changed by God in the Bible, it has particular meaning. Often it's related to what actually is happening in their life or a message that God has for them. But this afternoon we're thinking about God's own name. So I'd like to start in John 17 that we just read because there's a, it's an amazing chapter when you think about it. To have actually been able to eavesdrop on the Son of God praying to his Father. It's extraordinary. There was a time when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And they'd been seeing how the Lord prayed. And here he is in this chapter. And you can see what he's saying in the opening of this chapter. He says, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. You see, the whole of Jesus' life was about pleasing his Father. That's what he wanted to do. And part of pleasing his Father was to give other people an opportunity to be close to the Father too. Because Jesus loved his Father and he wanted to draw others to the Father that he knew. And he wants to draw us to the Father too. So he wants to glorify the Father. He wants to, through every act of his life, do what pleases him. Verse 3, and this is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That's such a profound verse. If we had said, well, what is eternal life about in the Bible? And we might very reasonably have said, well, it's about living forever. Which, of course, isn't entirely wrong, is it? There is that aspect, certainly, of immortal life, as we read of it in the Bible, but there is more than that. And the very essence of the life that God is promising to those who are faithful to him, well, it's here in this verse, the essence of it is to know God. And to know his Son. And arguably that's something which we can never achieve in this life. To know God ultimately, we would have to be like him. And yet God is saying to us through his son, if we can start to be like him ever such a little bit now, we can begin to comprehend something of his character. That's, that's the whole subject of 1 John, but that's another, that's another matter. Okay, so Jesus is bringing us close to God and he wants us to know him and his son. Now he says a wonderful thing in verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Jesus could look back over his life and know that he'd done what God wanted him to do. He'd been pleasing to him in every act of his life. And now, as he says this prayer, and the context is the Last Supper, he's about to come to the point where he's going to offer his life. So he says... Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So here's the disciples, the men that you gave to me, he says to God. And I have, what a strange phrase, manifested thy name to them. And then he says again in verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. <coughs> you see, when Jesus spoke, he didn't just say things that he just dreamed up. 
They were God's words. He said to them, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They're God's words. And they have come to know them and understand that thou didst send me, the end of verse 8 says. And then just verse 26 at the end of the chapter. And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. So when we come to John 17, just think about what we've read in this chapter. We have just read that Jesus says he has glorified God. We've read that he's manifested, that means to make visible God's name. And we've read, we read it in verse 8, that he's given them God's word. Wonderful things. In fact, we understand as we read through the, the New Testament, it wasn't only that Jesus spoke the word, he lived the word before them. He was the word made flesh. <coughs> and we shall think about that a, a, a little later. And then finally, verse 26, we read that he declared or made known God's name. So now I want to ask this question. What did Jesus mean when he said he had manifested or made visible and declared God's name? That's really what I want to think about this, this afternoon because this is at the heart of what Jesus is saying. As he thinks about his life, his desire to please his Father, what he's passed on to those special men that God had given to him. And I want to come back to John 17 before we close. So let's go to the Old Testament, to Exodus chapter 3. Now the context of Exodus chapter 3, of course, is Moses, and he's at the burning bush. He's in Egypt. The people of God are slaves in Egypt. Moses by God's help, he's going to bring them out of Egypt. There's going to be the ten plagues, and they're going to bring them through the wilderness eventually so that they can come to the promised land of Israel. But this is right at the beginning of that whole process, and here is Moses, and he's just seen this bush on fire to catch his attention, and he looks aside and sees, and he's absolutely amazed because there's a bush here that's on fire, apparently, but it's not being burned up. And he'd never seen that any more than you or I had done. So he's just seen it, and now he's going to be told something. Verse 12, well, well verse, verse 11, God has just said, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. Verse 11, Moses says to God, who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? God says this in verse 12, certainly I will be with thee. So you're not going alone, Moses. I will go with you when you leave Egypt. So you needn't worry about that. So that was a wonderful assurance for him in verse 12, that God was going to be with him. And you can quite understand for Moses that he would want God's help. And clearly we understand that that was the case. Verse 13, Moses said unto God, ah, but I've just been thinking about this. Behold, when I, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, they shall say to me, what's his name? <coughs> so Moses understands a barrier to start with. He says, I've got to know who this God is. And one rather feels, perhaps, as though the descendants of Abraham have, have lost touch a little bit with Abraham's God. I don't know if that's a fair analysis or not, but Moses certainly feels it necessary to ask that question that he can tell them. Now, God then is going to give them an answer. Verse 14, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Isn't that a strange phrase? So, so if you said to me, well, you know, what's your name? And I said, I am that I am. That would make you stop and think, wouldn't it? 
It may just be that there's a little bit more to this. You see, where we read in verse 14, I am, it's the same phrase that actually we've already read in verse 12, in the Hebrew from which this is translated. In verse 12, you remember, God said, I will be with you. When you go up and you take them with you, I will be with you. This is the same word. And so that we could perhaps equally well read it, I will be, says God, who I will be. And God, we understand from the scriptures, is the great uncreate, the, the, the uncreated one. He's always been there. And he's here now and he will always be here. And yet there is in the sense of this name also that he has a purpose. To show himself, I will be who I will be. And this name of purpose now is what Moses is going to have to reveal to the people. So he's just told them this, hasn't he, in verse 14, and what a marvellous explanation that was, and yet how it might have just mystified them slightly. Verse 15, God said moreover unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name for ever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So this is the name by which God chooses to be known. So first of all then, when we have in capital letters the word the Lord, in the Hebrew from which the Bible is translated into English, it's a word that, well, approximates in our language is something like Yahweh, which picks up actually on that idea we had in verse 12 of he who will be. Okay? And he's told us in verse 15 that this is a memorial name, a name to be remembered by. So, quite a remarkable name, as we've said. The Lord God of your fathers is he who is going to be revealed. This memorial name, incidentally, it's not only referred to in that way in Exodus. We can read in Isaiah, where the Almighty says, I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory will I not give to another. So he's quite emphatic about it, isn't he? When he reveals his name. We might think of the word in English, God, as being, well, that's what his name is. But clearly he's saying, actually, he's not chosen to reveal himself in that way. Although God, if you like, is a sort of shortened version of the English word good, probably, which wouldn't be entirely fit, unfitting, is it? Because Jesus said, there is no one good except God. But although that's true, that's not how Jesus, how God has chosen to reveal himself. He's given himself and revealed himself in a name of purpose. We can go a little further as well because you notice that in verse 16 we read the Lord God of your fathers. And the word God there actually translates from a Hebrew word which means mighty so that really what we have here in this chapter is the idea of the Lord, which means he who shall be, and God, the Hebrew word Elohim, which means mighty ones. And you can see if you put those together what he's really saying. It's not just I who will be or he who will be but that God has a definite intention. He has a purpose. It is that he will be mighty ones. He will be shown and understood and known and declared in mighty ones. That's his purpose. That's the message that Moses was, was to, be, to bring to the people of Israel. So from what we've said already then, God's name is a memorial of him. And his purpose, which is to fill the earth with mighty ones. We can read of it elsewhere in the Old Testament. Three times we have a very similar verse where God says that his purpose is to fill the earth with the knowledge of his glory as the waters cover the sea. And to fill the earth with the knowledge of his glory means people who know about him. That's his purpose. Let's go to Exodus 23 then, because there's another important principle in this chapter. Now we remember, perhaps, that when God led Israel through that wilderness, 
that they had the sign of God's presence with them. There was an angel at their front who was made known in the day by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire by night. And perhaps this is the angel that's being spoken of here. He had a very particular role in Exodus 23, and we just come to verse 20. Exodus 23, verse 20. God says, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. Just think about that. God says, look, there's an angel here who's an important angel. In actual fact, we understand from the rest of the Bible that this angel was actually in the bush that Moses saw that was burning. It wasn't just a bush that was on fire. It was God's very presence through the angel in the bush. And that's what Moses saw. Now look at what this angel does. Look at the power and authority that he has. God says, don't provoke him. He will not pardon your transgressions. And he's got the authority, verse 20, to go before you and to bring you into the place which I've prepared. God's angel. And here's the reason why. The end of verse 21. For my name is in him. You see that. Wherever you read the word for, it means, it means because of, doesn't it? And that means what you're about to read is because of this other thing. Or this thing that you've just read is because of this other thing, rather. So, because my name is in this angel, that's why he has this authority. So, verse 21 and 22 we've just read. My name is in him, and that means the angel represents God and carries his authority. Well, just think about that. It's a really important Bible principle here, that God's name of purpose can be given to one of his angels, and that angel can then represent God, can speak for him. And when the angel, when, when it says that God spoke with the angel, I'm sorry, when Moses spoke with the angel, Moses had that very particular then close relationship with him. So to bear God's name, is to represent him and to bear his authority. That's the role that angel undertook. Right, just going on to Exodus 34 now. Moses was given an amazing revelation of God, of his character and of his power. It was not an easy thing for Moses to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt. Indeed, it's been said it was much easier to bring <coughs> Israel out of Egypt than it was to bring Egypt out of Israel. That which Egypt represented, which in the Bible is the land of sin and death, the darkness and the shadow of death, the natural way of thinking that we all possess, well, that was difficult to shift. And Moses had to deal with them. They were not an easy people to deal with, just like we all are sometimes. And God was going to give him a vision to strengthen him on that journey and in that work. Have a look at verse 4. Of Exodus 34. Now Moses hewed two tables of stone like the first. He's been given the Ten Commandments. He was angry at Israel's failure and disobedience and he broke them. Now he's just been given another, another two, and he hewed two stables. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. So what we have in Exodus 34 then, <coughs> We've just read it in verses 5 and 6. What was it that God said that Moses was seeing in those verses? God's name was going to be proclaimed or to be called out. So we already know what God's name is from Exodus 3. And we saw the name being put onto an angel in Exodus 23. And now in a wonderful vision, 
and power to, to Moses. Now God's name is being called out. But do you notice what actually happens in this chapter? The Lord, the Lord God, that's the first thing. Here's that name again. The Yahweh Elohim, the he who shall be mighty ones. That's what's called out. There's the name being called out, but he doesn't stop there. He carries on, doesn't he? Verses 6 and 7. What are all those things in verse 6 and 7? Merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Those are attributes of character. That's not just what somebody's name is. That's what God is like. So God's name then is associated with his glorious character. It's not good enough just to say, well, that's his name and the name of purpose and intent, yes. But it's a name and a purpose that acts in a particular way. And here it is. It's summed up really in two words, isn't it? In, in Exodus 34, verse 6. He is abundant, at the end of that verse, abundant in goodness and truth. Goodness is mercy and compassion. And truth is absolute righteousness, that which God sees as right. And that's right at the heart of God's character. Those two principles. And, and God never acts out of line with those. In fact, he balances them beautifully in his own way. And God's name is all associated with that. That's what he actually sees. So let's see that. We've thought in those passages together about the wonder of God's ways and of his name. That a name was revealed to Moses that speaks of God's purpose and intent to fill the earth with mighty ones. He wants to fill them. He wants to be shown, in actual fact, the Bible tells us, in mighty ones. That if his name is put upon an angel, that angel comes to represent him and to bear his authority. And we've seen that that name is not just a name of purpose, but a name that reveals God's very character of grace, of goodness, and of truth and righteousness. So, now let's go to the New Testament and look at Matthew chapter 1. And being Matthew chapter 1, of course, we're now thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we are with that time when the angel Gabriel comes to Joseph and to Mary. Particularly in Matthew 1, it's to Joseph that the angel comes. Matthew chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 20. Now, I, I just need to explain this, of course, that <laughs> the angel has just told Joseph something which initially surprises him, which is, well, you're intended, the lady you're engaged to, as we would say, espoused to, is the Bible word, and in the Hebrew society it was a bit stronger than, than engagement, although they weren't yet married. This lady is about to have a baby. Joseph, for a moment, can't, can't, can't get his head around it because nothing like this has ever happened before. And so, verse 20, while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Here is a unique individual. This isn't your son, Joseph. It's God's son. This son is going to be conceived by the power of God himself. Now then, verse 21. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And here's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wonderful, isn't it? That's what he's going to do. Save his people from their sins. Right at the heart of the gospel message, we understand it. That all of us, naturally speaking, inherit death from our, from our very beginning and confirm the sentence by our sin. And here's this man who is going to actually wonderfully overcome it. But you see there's a word here that again has significance, isn't it? For. I, I, I focused on this a moment ago, didn't I? For he shall save. So what is that word for doing there in verse 21? In a way, we don't need to have it. We could have just said his name is going to be Jesus and he will save his people. 
The Almighty put it there for a reason. His name is called Jesus because he is going to save his people from their sins. So then the, word, the, the name Jesus must have a meaning then, mustn't it? And it does. For he shall save his people from their sins. And hidden within the English translation, if you like, the transliteration of the Hebrew name, is really this name, which we know more in our Old Testament English as Joshua. But of course in Hebrew it's really Yahshua. God's name. The very heart of God's name in Jesus' name. Remember Yahweh. He who shall be and Elohim mighty ones. Well, here, here it is. God's name, you see, can be joined with other things, other ideas. Not only the one who's going to be mighty ones, God has to do something else to bring mighty ones to being. He has to save them first. And in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to do it. Just that point on Jesus' name, the, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians, God has given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And it's not that Jesus' name is higher than Yahweh's name, it's that God has given Jesus his name, hasn't he? He's put his own name into Jesus' name. Because it's a name of purpose and intent. Do you remember that God put his name onto the angel? And when God put his name onto the angel, the angel bore God's authority and spoke for him. And now the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do that too. He's going to bear God's very name. He's going to speak for him, just like the angel spoke for him to Moses. That's why when Jesus said, the words I speak, they're not my words. They're God's words. I listen to what he says, says Jesus, and I speak. Not just what I make up. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ came to be the saviour, and we shall see why in another, in another reason too. So God's name of purpose, you see, and his ultimate end result is all through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself was to be a mighty one. And he was going to, the, the greatest victory, the, the act of might that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to do was to take on sin and defeat it and to destroy death completely in himself. <coughs> Whereas you and I, with the best of intention and try hard as we will, sooner or later or constantly, in reality, fail the Almighty. The Lord Jesus never did. He took on that battle in himself and overcame completely. And at the end, God raised him from the dead, never to die again. So Jesus was given God's name that he might represent him. And he came to save us, to fulfill that wonderful purpose that God has. To bring people out of the earth for him who are not naturally mighty. We aren't naturally mighty, any of us, in God's eyes. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said, see how many noble and mighty and powerful and rich people there are in the world who aren't listening to what God has to say. But to this man will I look, says God, to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. And if we're prepared to do that, <coughs> In God's great mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ, he can make us mighty for him, not through our own strength, but through him working in us. He can transform us. He can make us like the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to come back to that. Let's go on to John chapter 1 and just see how now this wonderful principle is extended to those who listen to the voice of Jesus. Now, John chapter 1 is all about the development of the sons of God. That regardless of our natural birth, God is looking for us to be his children. Verse 11, he came unto his own. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ coming unto his own people. And his own received him not. The people of Israel weren't listening to him. 
They rejected him and in, in the end, in large measure, and in the end they killed him. But as many as received him, to them gave he, author gave he power, that is authority or the right, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So, what a wonderful principle there is in that verse. Verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To those who were prepared to listen to the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, they could become sons of God if they believe on his name. That is, they can become part of God's family. Sons and daughters of the living God, that's the idea. That though we be naturally, if we read the Bible we understand, of course, we're not naturally sons of, sons of God in that natural sense. We tend to be sons of Adam in our behaviour and in our thinking. And yet now, we are to be sons of God, he says. And that's God's purpose in actual fact. Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that God's purpose is to bring many sons to glory. Now so far, there's only one son come to glory which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So God's purpose is not one son, but many sons to glory. That's what God wants to do. And that's why, in Ephesians chapter 3, the apostle writes, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. There's a family of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, he's saying. and We're all bearing God's name. Now, I happen to hear another translation of the Bible. I, I know this won't be news to, to you in, in many cases. The other versions of the Bible that we read are not always very reliable, but this one actually that I heard said that all the family, of whom all the families in earth derive their name. All the other families derive their name from his. Can you see the difference with this? All the family is named from him, by him, with his name. That's the point of Paul in Ephesians, surely. It's not that any other name in earth takes its name from his. What about heaven? Those in heaven, the angels in heaven, are part of God's name, aren't they? We've seen that already. That's the whole point of this verse. Those who become his children are named with his name. So we've got the angels who bear his name and represent him and do his will. We have the Lord Jesus Christ who similarly and above all demonstrate his character and his ways. And now those who become part of his family are also to bear his name then and to demonstrate him. That's really what God's purpose is, isn't it? To bring out of the earth a people for him. To bear the family name. So what we have in verses 11 to 13 is this wonderful spiritual idea that the Lord Jesus takes up in John chapter 3 and we have the account of Nicodemus where he talks to him about being born again and starting again, starting life again and being born, as it were, thinking as a child of God with the, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who believe in Jesus' name can become God's children and bear the family name of God. There's the principle that is being revealed. And wonderful as that is, in actual fact, because this chapter is dealing with the development of the sons of God, that this is actually a parallel of what happened to the Lord Jesus literally. Verse 12 and 13 has told us it's not about natural birth. Remember that verse 13 said, those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. In other words, the natural way of coming into existence is set aside in favour of that, of that spiritual birth and spiritual reawakening when we listen to God through his word. Now verse 14 is telling us God's view of the origin of the Lord Jesus. Look. And the Word was made flesh. You know, when we, we read in Matthew and Luke of how the Lord Jesus Christ came into existence, this is God's spiritual perspective of it, God's Word, His purpose, His intent and thought being manifested in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory 
the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came, the one who bore God's name, he showed God and he represented him how? Well, because verse 14 says, he showed us his character full of grace and truth, which you remember was what was revealed to Moses. That God's name in Exodus 34, full of grace and truth, that was the very essence, wasn't it, of God's character revealed in his name. And so John can say, can't he, in verse 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he's declared him. He's made him known. He's, well, sorry, as it is here, he's unfolded him. Here's the point. You can't see God himself. Even Moses, what Moses saw was a, was a representation of God through the angel. And here is the best demonstration of God that you could have in his own son, the character of God. Everything that they saw Jesus do, every word he spoke, every look that he gave to them, was part and a demonstration of God's character, showing them what God was like. So, the unseen God was unfolded by his Son, who revealed his character and declared his name. That's what the Lord Jesus did for them. He showed them the Father. Have you been with me so long, he said, and you don't understand? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. No one can see God himself, but his character and his ways. Well, you've seen that in me. I've represented him to you. I've borne his name, not just because I'm called Jesus, Yahshua, but because in my whole life, every day of my life, is to do his will. And I've lived his character in how I have behaved every moment of every day. So let's close in John 17. Remember that question. What did Jesus mean when he said he had manifested or made visible and declared, that is, made known, God's name? Well, we've just seen it together. God's name is a memorial of him and his purpose. It's associated with his glorious character. It's not just a name. It speaks of who he is and what he is like. And it tells us of his grand purpose to fill the earth with mighty ones, people like the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine living in a world with people full of the Lord, people like the Lord Jesus Christ? A world where sin is no more. And death has been removed from the scene. Ultimately, that's God's ultimate purpose, isn't it? Where every being praises God and glorifies him by doing his will. That's what God wants. That's when his name and his character will fill the earth. To bear God's name is to represent him and to bear his authority. The Lord Jesus Christ came and showed what God was like in every act of his life, in every moment, every part of his being. The angel went to prepare a way for them. The Lord Jesus Christ did that. To a way to prepare so that they might approach to God in his death and resurrection. He came to call us to God. To bring us to know him. That we might be with him ultimately in his kingdom. So that the unseen father was unfolded by the son who bearing his name declared it and revealed God's character of grace and truth. So God's ultimate purpose is that those who believe in the name can become God's children. Just compare these two verses. We, we've read them both actually already. The one on the right hand side, 
uh, sorry, the one on the left-hand side from John chapter 1 is that promise that we have in John chapter 1, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God that believe on his name. Those who are prepared to listen and to accept him into their lives and influence the way that they live, they could become his sons. Look in John 17, Jesus says, look, these disciples of mine, that's what they've done. The words which thou gavest me, they've received them and have believed that thou didst send me. These disciples are meeting that, that requirement, if you like. They've listened to the words of Jesus. They are on that road, aren't they? To becoming God's sons, to be the mighty ones that God has in mind. So, the Lord Jesus Christ, he who shall save, for there is no other name, said the Apostle in Acts 4, by which we might be saved, than the name which brings salvation, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom God is going to save. And God's great purpose to bring a mighty ones, many mighty ones, many sons unto glory, I'm so sorry, many sons unto glory, is his purpose. God is calling out to people for his name. And he actually quotes in Acts chapter 15 from the Old Testament that men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles, that even the non-Jews in God's purpose, all of us have a place if we, if we want it, if we want to follow after God. And all the Gentiles upon whom, you notice this, my name is called. God's name put on people, not, not just in some technical way, but that which it represents. In other words, they, they become like him ultimately, just as the Lord Jesus Christ has become like him. That's God's ultimate purpose. So let's finish here in verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. The Lord Jesus prays to his Father for those people who would hear the disciples preaching, who would listen to the word of the apostles and believe. And if we listen to the word of the apostles as we have it here and believe, we are amongst this number. The Lord Jesus is praying for us, desiring us to listen to his voice. And God's ultimate purpose might be brought to fruition. <clears throat> Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it. And how is Jesus going to declare to them his name? He's about to go and be hung on a tree, and demonstrate God's character of righteousness, and truth, and grace, and mercy, and bring others to God. The world has not known thee, verse 25, but I have known thee, and these have known that I have sent thee. The very essence of eternal life is to come to know God, we read in verse 3. God has revealed his purpose in his name, but it's not really about knowing the name, is it? It's not just about knowing what the name is. It's about knowing the God who is named by it and whose purpose is that he might bring us to him through the work of Jesus and that in so doing we might have hope of life with him in his kingdom. There's the challenge and the opportunity for us each day. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by Christadelphianvideo.org. 
for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by Christadelphianvideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.